This video is brought to you by Audible. If there's one thing I love more than watching stories unfold, it's being able to listen to them unfold. And when it comes to that, no one's got your back quite like Audible does. Whether I'm editing a video or trying to walk off the burrito I just guilt ordered, you can rest assured I'm almost always listening to one of the countless audiobooks or Audible originals they have to offer. And I never run out because having an Audible membership means I get a free credit to expand my library every month. This week I've been listening to The Arabian Nights, The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Seaman by Sir Richard F. Burton, and it's wonderful. It's a fascinating adaptation of the original tales of Sinbad and what made him such an iconic folk hero to begin with. And Sebastian Lockwood's narration is superb, to say the least. Another one of my favorites that I think you should check out is The Men Who Would Be King by Nicole Laporte, an incredibly gripping tale of the rise of DreamWorks as a studio narrated by Stephen Hoy. Go to audible.com slash breadsword, click on the link in the description, or text breadsword to 500-500 to start your 30-day free trial of Audible now. That's audible.com slash breadsword, the link in the description, or text breadsword to 500-500 to get an entire month of Audible, including a free audiobook and unlimited monthly Audible originals, on the house. Leave a comment below and let me know what audiobooks you're listening to and what others I should check out. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions red which yet survive. Stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them in the heart that fed, and on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. <laughs> like what? Anyways, I'm going to talk about pirates now. Alright, certified freak seven days a week, what are pirates? Let's start with etymology and work back from there. The English word pirate comes from the Latin word pirata, sea robber, which in turn comes from the Greek word piratus, meaning one who attacks ships. Fittingly, much of the first writing regarding pirates originated in Greece. Even though piracy as a practice has existed since humanity first took our commerce to the sea and the oldest records of piracy are from Egypt, it didn't come into its own as a well-documented ubiquitous profession until about the 12th century BC in the Big G. And for a while, it was actually perfectly respectable to be a pirate within Grecian culture. Uh, there are tons of references to piracy at the time as like a regular person thing to do. Declaring you were a pirate was the same as telling someone you work as an HR file clerk or a cashier at Yogurtland or something. Alas, how the tides must turn, the era of normal pirate time couldn't last forever, and as Greece came into its classical period, public opinion, in particular the opinion of high-ranking politicians and military leaders, shifted to viewing piracy as a disgraceful and eventually downright evil trade, which sort of worked in curbing its popularity, or at least the public admittance to it, but had the adverse effect effect of elevating pirates to an almost folk hero status in the eyes of any who had cause to detest the power structures fighting to suppress them. Well before pirates made their way into our fiction, they had already become conduits of the populace's resentment of the status quo, a vague idol of rebellion one could honor quietly from the shore, even if they were still regularly selling your neighbors into capital S for the price of a used 1992 Civic EG hatchback. As time went on, this cognitive dissonance became easier to maintain, and by the time we reached the golden age of piracy, a period of time from the 17th to the 18th century wherein pirates left their greatest mark on both written history and our pop culture, one thing had become abundantly clear. Stories about pirates are cool as shit. 
books detailing their adventures, both fiction and non-fiction, began flying off the shelves in every store that could stock them. In fact, our entire image of pirates, the reason so many were able to ascend to a sort of sainthood within our storytelling, is attributed to a single book published during this time, Captain Charles Johnson's A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, published in 1724. At the same time this new demand for tales of roguish adventurers in far-off lands was taking the West by storm, French archaeologist Antoine Gallon had just completed the first European translation of the most iconic collection of written tales on the planet, The 1001 Nights. The translation did numbers, so many that by the end of the century, the nights could be read in German, Italian, Dutch, Danish, Russian, Flemish, Polish, Yiddish, and English, among others. Gallon was credited with ushering in an entire era of fantasy storytelling within France. It was huge. Its many characters rapidly became part of the foundations of 18th century pop culture and beyond, Aladdin, Alibaba, and Sinbad being chiefly among them. 300 years later, Sinbad would grace the silver screen in one of the greatest pirate movies of all time, and barely anyone would see it. The year is 1992, and The House of Mouse just dropped their fourth film in a run of back-to-back -back bangers that would later come to be known as the Disney Renaissance, a little gem called Aladdin. Maybe you've heard of it. On top of being the highest grossing animated film of all time upon its release, Aladdin was also the first Disney film to cast a traditional celebrity in a starring role, something that would come to cause a great deal of division between the company and Robin Williams because he didn't really want to be used to sell the movie, and especially didn't want to be used to sell its merchandise, going so far as to stipulate the limitation of the use of his likeness in his contract. But Disney being Disney, they did it anyways. I have some people I want to thank. I can thank Jeffrey Katzenbug. We won't get into that here. Lindsay Ellis has an excellent video on it that you should check out if you haven't. The point is, even though Katz did her boy dirty, there was no going back. The stage had already been set. Gone were the days of animated features containing casts of conventional voice talent, and so began the era of selling animations with star-studded billings. Shortly after its release, the writers of Aladdin, Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, began scheming on a new flick for J-Rock's kingdom. If one adaptation from The Thousand Nights had worked, they thought, why don't we try another? A decade later, what they had come to write would finally see the light of day as Sinbad Legend of the Seven Seas, a certified hood classic, and the tremendous charm it possesses extends even to its very origins as a production. See, in July of that year, Disney under Jeffrey Katzenberg had announced their plans to the public to adapt the voyages of Sinbad into a theatrical feature, but two years later in 1994, Katz was forced to resign from his seat as chairman of the company and leave, immediately turning around to sue Disney for 250 big ones and using the settlement to bankroll his new studio, DreamWorks SKG. Basically ever since, it's been a running joke within the animation community that DreamWorks has lifted or at the very least taken a lot of creative inspiration from its contemporaries at Disney and Pixar, due mostly to the inherent bitterness in its foundations. And this isn't helped by the fact that Katzenberg did almost nothing but make enemies at both of these companies for like 20 years straight. Uh, an infamous example being when Katz had allegedly heard the entire original plot and approach of an upcoming Pixar film, A Bug's Life, from the at the time head of Pixar's animation department and his at the time good friend, John Lasseter. The story goes, Katz immediately realized its potential, and hoping not to fall behind a Disney-allied studio, sent his team to work on a DreamWorks response to it right away. Thus, we have ants. Even today, there's still discussions being had about the many characters and plot elements DreamWorks has seemingly poached from its peers. But there's only one we can prove. Because it happened in front of us. Sinbad. Legend of the Seven Seas is the only film we can say, irrefutably, that Katzenberg ever sacked from another studio. It began its life as a project by being stolen by its owner from himself. And I can't imagine a more fitting way for it to begin. So let's jump in. Sinbad opens with a silky smooth fade from the DreamWorks logo to a fathomless blackened sea of stars, the camera dolling backwards through a cluster of constellations as the title card appears. The film's opening track, aptly titled Let the Games Begin, composed by Harry Gregson Williams, gently accentuating the off-kilter tone we opened on as we descend to the center of a celestial sphere. As we come to a stop, an ensemble of strings briefly scurry across our ears in harmony with our first character materializing into frame. Introducing Eris, the best DreamWorks villain of all time. Eris's introduction is really cool. Uh, the decision to do away with the scheming antagonist cutaway often found within animated features, choosing instead to open the film with one, gives Sinbad's first 10 minutes an exceptional sense of immediacy. We know whatever is about to take place is the work of this character, and we're informed of this in like 40 seconds before our story sets sail. 
It establishes a pattern the film will rely on throughout the rest of its runtime to develop its plot, while subverting the deployment of this trope within its genre, while designating our protagonist and his foil their mythological archetypes, while allowing its hard opening sequence to flow seamlessly without interruption once it begins. And this also tees up an audience superior position, meaning we begin our story knowing more about its events than its characters, which the film later utilizes to great effect against us when the truth of its emotional apex isn't made clear to its protagonist or its spectators. Eris's divine gift is deception, so she begins the film by instilling us with a false sense of confidence. Also, I'm in love with how she summons Cetus as a constellation and then gives him a corporeal form as a means of reflecting the transition from the ethereal to the earthly and the external to the internal forces of our story. Anyways, let's get down there. Cetus splashes into the sea in sync with the low thunder of a bass drum. As a ship enters frame right, our noble prince immediately followed by another to its left, our black-hearted thief. The visual dichotomy between them is super on the nose, but this lack of subtlety does nothing to impede on the quality of their imminent clash or the film in general. We cut from our extreme wide of the sea to a ground level shot aboard the latter ship's deck. Its small crew stood at attention as their captain, clad in crimson, swaggers forward with a dog at his side as a familiar voice begins to ring out across its bow. Cut to reverse, we're still on the floor, but now we get a good look at his companion. This dolly shot actually does some surprisingly heavy lifting. We still haven't seen our characters or heard any of their names, besides the sea monster, but we know whose ship we're on. Spike the Dog is a brilliant addition to the pirate cinema form that, in retrospect, feels like a no-brainer. Rather than our first close-up being of our protagonist, someone we've just been introduced to as a man without a conscience, we're shown the exceedingly happy pup at his side. Our first moment of pushback against the way he's introduced to us and then consistently characterized by nearly everyone not a part of his crew, including himself, in the film, a black-hearted thief. Cut again and we get a behind the shoulder shot as our MC gazes towards the sun-drenched horizon. Another classic adventure homily the film relies upon to communicate the intrepid nature of its leads. Very Raiders of the Lost Ark. Jump to our second close and we're officially introduced to the titular rapscallion of our tale. With our hero acquainted and his ambitions made clear, we now enter what is, affectionately, just seven minutes of animated flexing. And it is some of the coolest shit ever. The once static camera has come to life, turning into another member of the ship's now exhilarated crew. Williams' score heaves itself into the foreground, while in one motion, Sinbad swings to the prince's ship, unsheaths his swords in the middle of a double backflip, then lands to take on four soldiers single-handedly. Cut back to the ship. By the way, it's called the Chimera. In every Sinbad book, comic show, movie, whatever, it's called the Chimera. Uh, cut back to the Chimera, and Spike launches himself on a purpose-built dog-specific catapult and takes out two more before touching the floor. Cut again, and the crew join the assault. This is sincerely one of my favorite ensemble fights ever. Every character's style, from their weapon choice to their means of traversal throughout the environment, is super unique and illustrative of their place within the crew's dynamic. The first two land, each holding one end of a staff. Their especially unorthodox fighting style, reflective of their mutual rank as the premier comic relief of the crew. Then Kale, ripping off an entire board from the ship and immediately launching a soldier out of frame with it, perfectly juxtaposing Sinbad's dexterity, while Jed plummets into frame under the board and rips the camera along with him to throw a hand full of bombs at some soldier's feet. Cut from the explosion, Sinbad is balanced atop one of his swords, cuts the rope in his hand to bind a soldier's ankle in place while simultaneously blocking another swing, planting his sword into the deck to side flip around him, forcing him to cut the other rope, sending the first one flying, then catching his sword as it falls, and turning them into devil sticks to fend off another two. This choreography is some of the most imaginative and insane that I've ever seen in a feature film. This is 2008 Monty Ohm Dead Fantasy 2 shit, and I love how they play on just how much of a spectacle for spectacle's sake it is. Moments later, with Kale commenting that Sinbad's last move, a horizontal pinwheel kick all of the Matrix reloaded but with dual cutlasses instead of a pole, was a bit over the top, only to then catch a man's blade in his teeth and flip him overboard with nothing but his neck. Anyways, let's speed this along a little bit. Only one member of the opposing crew can hold his own, and Sinbad knows him by name. Proteus. Sinbad wants to steal the ship's treasure, the Book of Peace, which seemingly protects the entire known world, but is also described as just being for 12 specific city-states? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't really matter how it works. What matters right now is that Sinbad is chasing a bag. Proteus demands to know where he's been, because they were BFFs before Sinbad went MIA as a kid, and Sinbad is doing his darndest to seem like he doesn't care. But he does. S and P share a brief duel, then Cetus interrupts it with his long, long hands. Some comedy noises occur, the pair team up to defeat the beast with this particularly awesome set piece, and as 
as it slips back into the briny deep, Sinbad pushes Proteus out of the way and is yoinked into the abyss right down with it, Proteus only being stopped from trying to save him in turn by his soldiers. Given how limited our time is to develop a sense of their bond before Sinbad leaves him in jail for like an hour of runtime, I think the latter half of this first sequence does an excellent job of conveying how close they truly were through the same physicality it defines the rest of the crew with. More than just stating they were friends once, which Sinbad plays down, it makes it a point to show us how well coordinated and natural feeling their movements are in tandem, and how similarly they fight and think. Also, I love the guy who spit out and then immediately charges back towards Cetus. Some very strong, extra pissed guy in the charge of the Rohirrim in Return of the King energy. Anyways, Sinbad's under the sea, and Eris finally makes her formal appearance. Sinbad and Eris strike a deal stipulating he steal the Book of Peace and post made it to Tartarus in exchange for his life and more stacks than he knows what to do with. So Sinbad accepts and follows Proteus to Syracuse with every intention of following through. I like just how strongly opposed Proteus' dad, King Dimas, is to Sinbad's presence at the celebration, because a lot of times interclass friendship, in particular in animation, is significantly downplayed in how classism, both conscious and unconscious, can actually affect the poor member of that friendship. Like Princess and the Frog, to use a contemporary example, uh, it's really weird and kind of fucked up that like Charlotte LaBeouf and her father are grossly wealthy specifically off of sugar plantations, and the thought never once occurs to them to just airily, without feeling any real hit to their personal financial security, cut a check to the black family who has waited on them for the duration of Charlotte's life. And then the film like makes it a point to frame it as virtuous on Tiana's part for not feeling bitter about that about the deep southern sugar baron whose wealth is predicated on the slavery of her grandparents' generation, not, you know, helping her without demanding exorbitant labor in exchange for it. Then again, kind of on brand. Anyways, Dimas is mad. Some more comedy noises occur from the crew. I adore the bit of Jed just endlessly unloading weapons from nowhere. Proteus defends Sinbad, and with little time to spare, we're introduced to the second lead of the film, Marina, Proteus' soon-to-be. Sinbad recognizes her too, but this time the recollection is one-sided, and he departs empty-handed with a frown, leaving Eris to impersonate him and steal the book instead, kicking off the Odyssey which comprises the rest of the film. Speaking of Odysseys, we're in Greece. Sinbad Legend of the Seven Seas is a film about Sinbad the sailor in about as liberal the sense of the word about can be used. But to be clear, I, I don't think that's a bad thing, nor is it an irregularity for Sinbad. The original seven voyages of Sinbad the Sailor are a collection of episodic tales, what's called a story cycle, based in Baghdad during the reign of Harun al-Rashid of the Abbasid Caliphates in around the year 790-ish. The first of the seven is a frame story, a structural technique used throughout the Thousand Nights to establish an in-universe narrator to another character acting as the reader's stand-in. There isn't one Sinbad, there are two. Sinbad the Porter and Sinbad the Sailor. The story goes, an impoverished servant briefly rests on a bench outside of a rich merchant's home, where he prays to Allah about the injustice of a world which allows the rich to live in ease while he struggles endlessly but remains poor. This guy gets it. I just feel like Big Daddy LaBeouf could have dropped something crazy in the tip jar for the one time and fixed like most of Tiana's problems. Patreon.com slash breadsword. The merchant overhears this and sends for the man to be let inside, whereupon they realize they share the same name. And you'll never guess what it is. Sinbad the Sailor tells Sinbad the Porter he came into his wealth by fortune and fate across seven magical voyages, which he then tells to the Porter, giving him a more expensive gift at the end of each of the tales. The moral of the cycle being, if nobody got me, I know Allah got me. The thing is, again, the first translation of this the Western world was introduced to was in the early 1700s. We're talking real deal pirate season. And a lot of the more religious aspects of the knights in general were either edited out by Gialon or sort of ignored by its readers. So what we're left with is just the voyages themselves. The poor Sinbad is the audience, so we drop him and the frame, instead focusing entirely on the adventures of the other Sinbad, who transcended his poverty by way of sailing, while the hottest book in town is our pal Charles Johnson's being read by a populace who idolizes pirates for doing exactly that. The retooling of Sinbad into a pirate was a natural next step, and his name eventually became so synonymous with piracy, even even some Japanese pirate films that have nothing to do with Sinbad have been localized in the West as Sinbad movies. Shoutouts to Shiro Mifune, I loved you in the lost world of Sinbad. And the next step of separation wasn't far behind. Sinbad began appearing in films, shorts, and TV shows, always with a different cultural makeup, age, demeanor, and narrative alignment. The first depiction of Sinbad on screen in the West was Ub Ewerks' Sinbad the Sailor in 1935, and the following year, he made his mainstream debut in Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor, wherein Sinbad as a Bluto Echo Fighter wraps his introduction to the audience. I'm Sinbad the Sailor, so hardy and hale. I live on an island on the back of a whale. 
Okay, I can't believe that bitch back in the day really got stunned. I'm going up in that Lambo, got arms in that bitch with some energy. Watch out for money. Oh, shit. The tenuous connection to the original tales would continue to wax and wane with the tides of each new rendition. Ray Harryhausen's Sinbad trilogy with Columbia Pictures, for instance, portrays Sinbad as hailing from Baghdad, and even tries to capture some of the elements of each of his voyages, while Richard Wallace's Sinbad the Sailor stars Douglas Fairbanks across Maureen O'Hara in a secret eighth voyage wherein they discover the lost treasure of Alexander the Great. So by the time we reach Sinbad Legend of the Seven Seas, what better way to revisit the story than to not only lean all the way into him being a pirate, but to begin his adventure in the same collection of sunny peninsulas that so much of our cultural conception of pirates came from. And then, even better, why not combine the adventuring spirit of Sinbad with the populism and aesthetic of pirates, but the structure of a famous Greek tale? Check this out. DreamWorks' as Sinbad is based on a Greek legend, written to illustrate the Pythagorean ideal of friendship. Pythias is accused of and charged with plotting to kill Dionysus I of Syracuse, and requests to be allowed to travel home and settle his affairs before he's put to death. Believing he'd simply flee and never return, Dionysus refuses his request, so Damon, his companion, offers himself in his place. Should Pythias not return, Dionysus insists Damon will be executed for the crimes instead. Dionysus is all but convinced Pythias has fled, and on the last day he has to return, he calls for Damon's execution. But just as the axe is about to fall, Pythias comes back to stop it. So astonished by the love of their friendship, Dionysus pardons them both and sets them free. Amusingly, the reason Pythias gives for being late is that pirates had captured his ship and thrown him overboard. So, this is a pretty clear analog, right? Sinbad is Pythias, Proteus is Daemon, Dimas is Dionysus. The story being set in Greece also allows for some pretty esoteric jokes that I really appreciate. Like here, when Eris meets Sinbad, she mentions that he must have seen her likeness on the temple walls, and he hesitates before giving this clearly half-hearted response. This reads as him being naturally pretty confused and nervous, of course, but it doubles as a jab at Eris's ego because historically Eris didn't have any temples, and she was hardly ever portrayed in artwork at the time. This radical change in structure relative to Sinbad's other cinematic adaptations also allows for an audience surrogate to be reintroduced to the narrative without requiring a cumbersome framing device. Marina is Sinbad the Porter, and this time what she laments is a thirst for experiences, not riches. Marina is a fantastic proxy because not only is it most natural for her to be given exposition from Sinbad and Proteus as to their relationship with one another and the world as they traverse it because both of them are subjects as unfamiliar to her as they are to us, but her emotional reactions to what she learns and how these characters behave provide a really comforting mirror. In specific, I think her reaction to Sinbad failing Eris's test, this sort of unrefined, frustrated insistence that the circumstances themselves are the problem rather than the people within them, is one of the most honest responses to a plot twist I've seen a character meant to reflect us give. Also, speaking of realistic reactions, who decided to put Spike whimpering at the sight of Sinbad about to be executed in the movie? What is your fucking problem, bro? Literally every time I watch this movie, I've, I've watched this like 13 times this week. It still makes me cry when he whimpers like that. Oh my god, you're a monster for that. Marina's enthusiasm for the adventure they're on is unmistakable, even in their greatest moments of peril. And the ways in which this consistently clashes with Sinbad's childish imitation of disdain towards her makes for some of the funniest and most organic back and forth found in DreamWorks' catalog. The apology fight she has with Sinbad after she saves them from the sirens doesn't feel like animated characters bouncing off each other for a bit. It feels like a regular argument that takes on the character of a bit to us, which is a huge difference. Honestly, I think most of what makes Sinbad work so well as a film, beyond its spectacle, is how outstanding its two women characters are. Eris is, and you cannot argue me down from this, the best character DreamWorks has ever made. I will die on this hill. And Marina is absolutely electrifying, possessing more traits of an adventure protagonist than Sinbad himself in acting as a perfect ballast between his and Proteus's respective extremes. And this extends to the film's use of color as well. Sinbad is cloaked in reds and browns, while Proteus dons blues and golds, and Marina is draped in all four. I mentioned before that the film's lack of subtlety isn't an indication of its quality, and this is sort of what I mean. Its structure, its very foundation, lies in dichotomy, in the means of finding unity within that. And when leaned into, this elevates the work rather than harming it. One of my favorite instances of this use of contrasting blues and reds in the film is at the end of their SSX Tricky rescue mission, when Sinbad and Marina crash onto the Chimera and are enveloped by a sail on its deck. 
when we cut to a shot from their side, gazing into one another's eyes, the sun illuminates it from behind, diffusing the light into a warm, peachy glow in the middle of this otherwise frigid waste of blues and whites. I think this very in-your-face style of visual storytelling also does well in complementing the instances of delicacy when they are there. Sinbad's muffled reverence for Proteus and deeply repressed love for Marina causes him to interact with her physically in a really interesting way compared to most animated feature protagonists and their love interests. Following their initial interaction on the ship where he carries her out of his cabin as he's trying to establish his feigned contempt for her, he only makes any kind of contact with her in instances of extreme danger. Which like, yeah, of course, but in the moments where he is given time to choose how he does so, he grabs her sleeves instead. It's only after they're falling down the mountain that he realizes she'll be hurt if he doesn't let go and actually hold her. This makes the following scene where he deliberately touches her hand for the first time, both her reaction of shock and his reaction to it to lightly place her hand on the wheel instead of committing to holding it, all the more tender. I also find it really endearing that just like DreamWorks' last adventure film containing a love triangle, Legend of the Seven Seas is like way too horny. But to allow for this precarious romantic dynamic to work, all of that sexual energy had to be channeled to Eris specifically. It just makes her more of a bad bitch, and I'm glad that that was the move. The cosmic bubble bath into snow globe transition match cut from the constellation behind it? Queen. Also, this is as good as any time to mention it, this film's cast is crazy. Brad Pitt nails the precocious sarcasm and underlying sensitivity of Sinbad. It, Catherine Zeta-Jones kills as Marina. Her delivery from her most enchanting to her most scathing lines is so consistently on point. Michelle Pfeiffer as Eris has got to be a top five casting decision for any animated character ever. And Joseph Fiennes as Proteus honestly steals the show, despite how little screen time he has. The way he sends that when you knew how much it meant to us line? Not you two. Stealing the Book of Peace when you knew how much it meant to us. Proteus. Bro was on it. Also, Frank Welker, the original voice of Fred Jones from Scooby-Doo, plays Spike, which I just really appreciate. Scoob lineage in your cast is always a net positive. After Sinbad reveals to Marina that the reason he and Proteus had drifted apart was because Marina herself, her arrival in Syracuse so many years ago being what had finally afflicted him with envy for Proteus' life causing him to flee, they nearly share a kiss. But echoing her hesitant, somber response to Proteus' proposal earlier in the film, she stops it before it happens. The soothing score underlying the moment they shared briefly recedes, and then quickly returns as a frenetic collection of strings and choir vocals, instantly shifting the scene's gentle and bittersweet tone to one of mischievous anxiety. Our adventurers have finally reached Tartarus. As they approach the edge of the world and what lay beyond it, the string sections, dashing over the now heightened crashing of the wake against the Chimera, continue to gain momentum as Sinbad calls for Rat to give him a lookout. Rat declares that the world just ends and that they're surely done for, to which the comedic pair respond with a flat earth joke, once more iterating upon the gag of their placing bets on the various circumstances they've run into over the course of the film. What follows is the single coolest moment in the entirety of pirate storytelling history. Sinbad repeats what Eris had told him, to follow the star beyond the horizon. And after he repeats it a second time, we cut to a wide shot of the towering water jets encompassing our world's end, the score being forced out of the foreground by an explosion of wind. As it returns, it evolves again, this time from an anxious break to an exultant reprisal of Sinbad's leitmotif, as he orders the crew to free all sheets. They're not going to sail to Tartarus, they're going to fly to it. Even before the especially cool part happens, you know, where they sail a boat on the winds off the edge of the planet into a shimmering void of lightning towards the gate of what the Greeks described as Hades' New Game Plus, the care taken to show the Chimera's crew actually enact all of Sinbad's orders to make it possible is, I think, where the film shows its truest self. Legend of the Seven Seas is the most unabashed expression there is of the belief that pirates simply are cool as shit. Nearly all of its grandiose uses of dynamic camera work throughout it is spent following its crew in what feels like a series of assiduously rehearsed dances. The way in which Rats, in particular, is capable of navigating the ship's rigging is otherworldly. What most pirate films simplify to a single line in the crest of its action, if their captain even gives a specific order at all during its runtime, Sinbad dedicates entire, uninterrupted minutes to. The way it frames this interaction between the Chimera and its crew as a waltz rather than a cumbersome necessity is perhaps best portrayed by the torch sequence immediately following their departure from Syracuse. There is no dialogue and there is no focus. There's only the sounds of the sea and of the ship as its crew steps, swings, and spins in time with the music. 
This brief sequence is even given its own track within the score, lighting lanterns. Anyways, the chimera takes flight. The sense of scale and the use of Williams's fantastic theme for Sinbad is rapturous, to say the least. Marina insists that she go with Sinbad, and he accepts. The pair holding each other in the same way they had previously to retreat from danger, now willingly swinging into the heart of it together, surrounded on all sides by the coalescence of their chromatic identities. The pair lands in a desert, mimicking the sea, where Eris has been waiting. She reveals the true scope of her intentions, as any good adventure villain does in the third act. And at the end of her you suck just as much as I do speech to Sinbad, she gives him a chance to prove her wrong. A test of his supposedly absent heart. Just like Damon and Pythias, Eris too believes that if Sinbad must return to meet his death, he'll choose to flee, not just for his life, but the woman he and his friend love. Sinbad declares he'll go back, his theme once again swelling beneath his heroism, and he takes three steps. And then Eris says he's lying, and the ground crumbles beneath him, and he fails. Marina and Sinbad return to the mortal world, and it's here, stranded on a sandbar nestled upon the outskirts of eternity, that Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas, reaches beyond itself to interrogate the once prevalent cinema of piracy and our once tremendous love for it. Sinbad's insistence upon his own monstrousness, in spite of what we know to be his true character, represents the change in cultural appetite that swept the genre away 40 years ago, leaving in its place an industry almost entirely reliant upon the enemies of our former heroes as the protagonists of their stories not allowed to be too critical of even fictional versions of their dominion, lest the military pull their cartoon-sized checks out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe or Transformers or whatever for mentioning they are sometimes mean. The remission of adoration for these now eroding monoliths of storytelling. And Marina's rebuke of this self-resignation, her insistence that there is yet good in him, is ultimately the film's and its author's appeal to its audience. That this genre does not have to stay deceased. Sinbad returns to face his death, the same as Pythias, and the same as the colossi he's carried on his back since he first entered frame on the deck of the Chimera. And just like our tale from so long ago, his valiance is rewarded with his life. Eris is forced to return the Book of Peace, which we still have no understanding of because he kept his word. Dimas apologizes for misjudging him. Proteus and Sinbad make up, and having made his peace with Marina, sends her with his blessings to set sail with a chimera, surprising Sinbad as they cheerfully embark on a new adventure into another sun-drenched horizon. Happy endings are always my favorite. I wish I could come up with one for this. I, I don't think that there is another screenwriter alive on the planet who wanted to see the return of pirate cinema more than the pair who toiled away at feature after feature for Disney just for permission to adapt Treasure Island. I mean, Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio are responsible for the only three major efforts to bring the pirate genre back to life in the West. John Logan may have written the final script for Sinbad, but Ted and Ter are the ones who handed it off to him and it didn't work. Treasure Planet lost Disney millions and spelled the end of their traditional animation, and Sinbad did the same for DreamWorks. Marina, Sinbad, Proteus, Kale, Eris, Dimas, this is the last time we ever saw hand-drawn characters from the studio. When interviewed about Sinbad's performance, Jeffrey Katzenberg said, I think the idea of a traditional story being told using traditional animation is likely a thing of the past. Pirates of the Caribbean, their third effort was a brief success, sure, but it inspired no others. And it wasn't long before the reins were taken from them there as well. By its third film, At World's End, it began to sink into something wholly separate from its inceptive identity. Disney going so far as to cut the scene where Jack Sparrow finally explains how he became a pirate hunted to the ends of the earth by the East India Trading Company in the first place. We had a deal, Jack. I contracted you to deliver cargo on my behalf. You chose to liberate it. People aren't cargo, mate. Too outwardly critical of a specific government, and Disney didn't want to lose money. I'm willing to bet whoever made that call probably didn't get Captain Blood. What a creature must sit on the throne who lets a man like you deal out his justice. 
practice the trade of piracy on the high seas. We, the hunted, will now hunt. Even if the crescendo of the film is a deliberate reflection of Bloods. I love Sinbad. The first time I saw it as a kid, I leapt to my feet and spent the rest of the day running and jumping and yelling and fashioning a stick I found into a saber, imagining I too was this wondrous character who is impossible to be, sailing through a world that never existed but should have. And, and I think, at their base, that's what pirate stories have always been, an exercise in our collective imagination, one where a new adventure awaits on the edge of every horizon. I love how visually captivating it is. Just like The Road to El Dorado, its characters were traditionally animated while its environments and its background actors were rendered digitally. What it lacks in polish relative to its older siblings, though, it more than makes up for in design and animation. Every glimpse of the sky in Sinbad feels like looking up at the threshold of a dream. Its pacified purples, its brilliant blues, and its halcyon oranges, only matched by the wonder of the actions of the characters beneath them. To so fluidly portray such grace of movement in harmony with its many independent background elements, created in a completely different medium while the camera tracking around them is moving at a pace that's rarely matched to this effect even today, is a Herculean task to have achieved and its entire animation team deserves endless cheer for accomplishing it. Sinbad is a pirate film set in ancient Greece with a downhill tandem snowboard chase through an ice cave and two separate skydiving sequences. Even if it reused a couple of instances of animation from the studio's previous works to save money, its original environments are so striking that even later Pirates of the Caribbean films call back to them. The way Sinbad launches himself with a ballista into the face of a thousand foot tall cliff with a knife held perfectly in his mouth is one of the most whimsical stunts in anything I have ever seen. They had our boy finessing through environments like a Breath of the Wild any percent run and it's crazy. I love how stupid it is. I mentioned a couple times how its central plot device is literally never given any meaningful attempt at an explanation and that is fantastic. A good adventure is never about understanding the mechanics of the world it takes place in. A good adventure explains just enough to follow its path and then tells you to stop worrying about it. And Tom Finan understands this beautifully. He cut it to the bone, leaving out almost any chance for exposition dumps or anything else that isn't instrumental to its progression, and as a result, Sinbad moves along at an incredibly brisk pace of 86 minutes for a tale that covers a whole shitload of ground. I counted, and there are only like two moments in the entire film I would cut down, and it's by a second or two each. Its romance is rushed and schlocky, but in a really endearing way. Half of the Chimera's crew is never even given names Games, and its score is unreasonably good. Arguably Sinbad's weakest sequence, The Attack of the Sirens, purely because the water effects used for them look considerably worse than anything else in the film, is more than made up for by this being the strongest moment in Williams's compositions and the awe-inspiring design of the environment it takes place in. The dragon's teeth defies all physical laws, effectively being a mega ramp made of water, and there's so much joy in not needing to justify its existence. I, I love how its music synchronizes with the clashes of Proteus and Sinbad's blades during their introduction to further articulate the depth of their duality. I love that the last lines of the film are a cheesy callback to an argument from the beginning of their voyage followed by a kiss just like the ending of Against All Flags. And I love that they cut so many corners with its lighting that by any objective metric it is genuinely bad, but it somehow manages to not be within context and actually helps to underscore its already melodramatic, dreamlike aesthetic. Sinbad Legend of the Seven Seas is not conventionally a great movie, but it is the best pirate movie, because it correctly contends that the real foundation of our love of pirates has always been the desire to encounter something new. Piratis, from Peromai, meaning I attempt, in turn from Pera, to experience. Sinbad first acquainted himself with us in moving images as a cartoon from the same man who designed Mickey Mouse, so if pirates had to die, why not try to give them a rebirth in the medium they rightfully belong in, where thought can be given form free of restriction and their titanic stature in our narrative memory can be given a new day. But still, it wasn't enough. It ran DreamWorks 60 mil to produce, and it peaked at 6th place beneath Legally Blonde 2 and Finding Nemo, only pulling in 7 million its opening weekend. The week after its release, Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearl premiered, all but assuring that Sinbad would sink to the box office floor. 
an ironic twist of fate considering its genesis. It eventually made back 20 million, but it was just too late. DreamWorks' era of traditional animation had come to a close, and the extraordinary world of pirate cinema took its last breath with it. It sucks, but that's just what happens to things we love. Sick transit Gloria, right? Even glory fades. The pirate's gold, the seahawk, the black pirate, the buccaneer, Captain Blood, the black swan, Captain Kid, Frenchman's Creek, the Spanish main, against all sails, the pirates of Penzance, all but forgotten by most. Our most grandiose creations and our most ubiquitous heroes will someday be lost, and we will build new ones, and then they will diminish in turn. But the phantom pains will always remain. An acute awareness that something alive was once there. Westerns, musicals, noirs, pirate films were not the first genre to wither beneath the tides of time, and they certainly won't be the last. Maybe someday you'll see a flash of a now long abandoned form in a contemporary work, a one-off medium budget from some studio with money to burn, and it'll feel like a lightning bolt struck you in the chest, and you'll go, yes, that's it, that's what we were missing, and then it too will recede. The pedestal is revealed but for a moment, and then is covered once more by the wax and wane of the shifting sands. Maybe that's why they imagined hell as a desert. Have a good night. Thanks for watching. Big, big, big thank you to my patrons for making this video possible, uh, especially these guys. And a very special thank you to Sam Penn, Blade Lord Yuda, Anzu, Miranda Shana, Ethan Fry, Sean Chan, Sinuet, Dusky Dancing, Derek McDonald, Emma Brownlee, Carson Davidson, John Dow, Exotic Spoon, A Werewolf, Solar Hernandez, Stoop Andrews, Nicholas Bloom, Rickard Bergstrom, Daniel Elizald, Daniel Martinez, Kevin Truong, Rollback Flapjack, Sandre Gravdal, Ghostly, Tavian Nelson, Nick Orjuela, Solomon Bell, Cody Dean, Almighty Dwarf, Jabiji, Cloudy, Scrubbin, Menu, Rick W, Rafael Da Silva, Chance Thrash. What's good with you, Chance? I love you, bro. Sham Kumar, Unknown, Grady B. Olson, Reverse Polarity, Bean, Aiden Sales, The Queen, William Brulon, David Maynard, Daniel Dimitro, Sawyer Coast, Jake Pitch, Jordan May, Fox Hunt, Jeremy Wilkins, Cedar Tyranny, Fog Knight, Sarah L., Nathan Martin, Peyton Williams, NCPD Medic, Christian Wells, That One French Guy, Koala Bala, Saint, Nicholas Lewis, SSGT Snuggles, Dustin Treese, Austin Hart, Elizabeth, Ayushi, Scribe Scribbles, Brian the Epic, Johnny B. Good, Ryan Randolph, Liam the Child, Clunt, Senior Gambit, Bino, Enrique Gomez, Meshock Brooks, ZN Employee, Preston Nicolizio, Gregory Babcock, VHS Daydreams, Holden Williams, Guister, Aaron Brannon, Stephanie Langdu, Tyler Eaton, Walter J. Taggart, Patrick Foster, Joshua Ilvesaker, Ethan Boyd, Evan Jones, Spencer Neptonic Lynch, Yuri Voice, Granule, Lauren Godako's Flag, Jack Dixon, Tyra Rogers, Presktail, Amy Wen, LW, Uneducated and Enthused, Benjamin Reed, Ram Lico Grady, Dante Cantone, Kintsuge, Manda Panda, Luke Hudson, Space Ghost, Madeline Foley, Alex Fenn, The DJ, Lakota Rawls, Kevin Thurber, Quinn Whiteley, Kevin Johnson, Diego Aras, Simon Riley, Grand Shock Trooper, Ivan Dolvid from Jagged Alliance 2, Buttershield, Maximum Crash, Kane King, The One Who Memes, Louis, Eric Cusant, I Am Badgers, Jack Buckets, Spoons, Luigi Murray, Michelle Wen, Mohamed El Zafri, Avid, No Community, Tristan VS, Robert Whaley, Straffin Nathan, Robin Namini, Skelly V, Alexi Aro Olavi, Tristan Marino, Joshua Kodamal, Blake Demby, Sergeant VR, Gavin Miller, Long Hyun, Ho Shin, Shane Vino, Mumblecore Max, Yo Lane, Jacob New, Rory Strickler, Charles J. Boyle, Travis Osborne, and Winter Fay. Let me know what you thought about what I thought down below. Make sure to like and subscribe if you feel like seeing more slick vids like the one you just watched. And if you really want to help out, consider becoming a patron. Every penny helps me try to make this thing a full-time gig. Anyways, love you, love you, love you, and have a good night.